back. It's uh, the, the two o'clock rock here on a Friday, and we have Peter Carlisle. We're going to talk with Peter Carlisle about so many things that are really interesting because he has lived in a, in another kind of world. Sorry, Peter, I said that. Well, it's probably true. I <laughs> I, I, I always felt like an alien. <laughs> <laughs> just just to you know give you the short summary of it. Uh, He's been a prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu, the, what is it, the third elected prosecuting attorney. Well done. Thank you very much. And he was the 13th mayor. All of the mayors were elected. <laughs> yes, I thought so. That seemed to be a problem. <laughs> and he's now a partner in the O'Connor firm, and good for him. And he's, you know, back to his, you know, training roots, I guess. Exactly correct. So practice you, you start law. off, you know, you start working with the law thing, and then, you know, it progresses to perhaps another life, and then you get come back to home plate. Well, you've had a number of chapters in your book, but there's more to come, I think. <laughs> I hope so. I'm, I'm looking with uh, anguish and intent on the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, anguish in that it'll be a new experience and uh, content in that it will be and intent because I think it'll be a good experience for me as well as for that office. Uh, you know, I want to link those all these things up here in our show today with you, Peter. So the first thing is you're a prosecuting attorney, and you were a star-studded prosecuting attorney. I remember you did the Xerox case all by yourself. You prosecuted that case. Usually the prosecutor, the chief prosecutor, does not go down and try cases. But you did. You actually went and tried that case. You know, I, I, I felt strongly about that, because I think that if you sit around and spend your life as an administrator, you miss the kind of difficulties that your own people have to go through. I mean, they have to go down there, they have to stand in front of the judge, they have to argue in front of the jury, and their reputation and their ability is online. And when you're a prosecutor, you have these enormous uh, ethical pressures that are put on you as well. What do you mean by that? I think I was thinking about that as we, you know, drove down for the show. Um, ethical pressures, you, you represent a, not only a constituency, but a jurisdiction. All the people in the jurisdiction. And your job is not merely to seek convictions, and this is written into the ethics code, it is to basically make sure that you are doing it according to the rules and do everything you can within the guidance of the law. So your job is to follow the law and not simply, you have a horrible person, you know they've done all sorts of things, uh, it's not just to convict, it's to see that justice is done. Yeah, and it has a ripple effect. What I mean is what you do down there has an effect on the way the law is treated by others. If you make, if you're a bad example, right. uh, Nifon, the guy who was the Duke uh, lacrosse team, went out and chased some people for the wrong reason, uh, and then we suffer as prosecutors across the country. So you're right, the ripple effect can actually be uh, national, and if it's a big enough case, which would be the type of thing that the uh, uh, U.S. District Attorney would be doing here, uh, the federal prosecutor, uh, that would end up being international problems. Yeah. There so, I mean, I, th I think people watch what happens in court. That's why prosecutors are so important, not only in the city and county, but, you know, in the state circumstance and in the, in the federal circumstance. Because people watch, and, you know, we live in, everyone in the world lives in this kind of fabric of um, uh, the sort of the civilized mantle of respecting the law. And if we stop respecting the law, it would fall apart. And somehow it begins with the prosecutor. Somehow the prosecutor makes the point, you know, you got to follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, we're going we're gonna to use sanctions on you. And then people see that happen. They see the sanctions and they say, gee, I think I'll follow the rules. I, I think that's completely correct. I think it is something that has the right type of effect on a rule of law. And that's what we need to have. And that mantle is critical to a civilized society, in my opinion. Uh, but there are people out there who will routinely break the law. Uh, with nothing but uh, arrogance and narcissism and uh, perpetual repeated offenses. And uh, they have to be dealt with seriously. And yeah. uh, we, do, we do that by depriving them of liberty and yeah. sticking them in a prison sometimes yeah. and sometimes sticking them in for a very long time. Yeah. And although, you know, there are a lot of people who feel the prisons ought to be reformed, and indeed in many ways they should be reformed, the fact is that we need to do that for all the reasons that imprisonment is necessary in a civilized society. Well, take, take, take Uisugi and the Xerox massacre, which you brought up. I mean, frankly, there is no excuse for that guy ever seeing light again. He's still sitting in his prison cell happy about what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kirk Langford guy, who, I, if you remember Masumi Watanabe, we never found her body, uh, that was something that had international implications. And it was critical for us to make sure that we took this sociopathic, narcissistic, arrogant person 
uh, and keep him away from civilized society from now until he's passed away. And I, I yeah. wholly support that and yeah. should. Yeah, because I mean, it's not only me. I don't want him around me. I don't want him threatening my life. I don't want him on the street in my community. Um, but it's everybody. Yeah, you want to protect people from savage behavior. And whether they, the people, know that this guy is like he is, you, you know, but a lot of people, they wouldn't know. Well, you still have to protect them from him. That's a really good point, because you know that thing about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Juries very rarely see the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because of the exclusionary rule. Oh, sure. You've got all sorts of reasons why you can keep evidence from the jury, and some of that evidence is absolutely critical. But it's kept from them, they don't see it, and then you have a travesty of justice, and the prosecutor is going to be blamed for allowing this to occur when, in fact, it was the rules that we live by that have been, in my opinion, so inflated since the time of the Constitution that they're now no longer recognizable. I remember you were, you were not only a prosecuting attorney, but you were actually seeking um, legislation. And there was one bill, I don't remember the substance of it, there was one bill that you were, you know, supporting and you were very uh, passionate about. And you came to a meeting, I was running this meeting or involved in this meeting, I'll never forget. You got down, I don't know if you remember, you got down on your knee and you pleaded. <laughs> you pleaded with the people with my hands meeting, over my heart. With your hands over your heart that they should support your bill. Do you remember that? I, I recall that happening once, maybe twice in my career. <laughs> It was really touching. I think it had a big effect on people. And I'm thinking also of Rudy Giuliani, you know. I never forget, uh, I didn't know, you know, the, uh, the essence of his approach when he was prosecutor in New York, U.S. attorney prosecutor in New York. Um, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. He was the U.S. attorney. Yep. Um, but his thought was um, prosecute every little crime in the thought that people out there will see that you do enforce the law. And then they won't do murder. <laughs> If you prosecute the little things, the big things won't get done, won't happen. The broken window theory, and absolutely effective. If you do the quality of life crimes and you do them consistently, somehow the guy who's jumping over the turnstile and is brought to the ground and handcuffed and taken off for 48 hours in, in detention, uh, they say, if they're going to do this to me for that, uh, I'm not going to mess around with this. It was sort of, I, I'm trying to think where it was where they caned somebody for spitting on the ground. And Singapore. Singapore. And <laughs> shortly after that, there was a lot less saliva on the ground. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I met you once in that context, uh, in, in the think tech context. I remember I came up to your office, and I was very impressed. You were running a tight ship. You know, you were the, you know, you were the Elliot Ness kind of prosecutor. <laughs> and it was, it, was a, it was an interesting meeting. First time I met you, I remember that. But uh, from there, you went to mayor. And mayor's a di different kettle of fish. I mean, Completely. prosecutors have relationship with the public, though. I want to add that. And that sort of is part of the transition, isn't it? As long as you're putting people in jail, people like you. Yeah. As long as the potholes exist and there's sewer main breaks <laughs> and there's calamity around uh, from a tsunami or something like that, it's always the mayor's fault. <laughs> and, and rightly so. <laughs> So how was it being mayor? That was a real change of uh, a change situation. You know, I got to say, I think it was like the icing on the cake. I really enjoyed being mayor because you can do it uh, in such a way that you can have a tremendous impact on the quality of people in their everyday life. Uh, and it's a rare case when somebody is the victim of a very serious crime. But if you can sit there and make everybody happier when they're driving uh, to work, if they don't have to spend two hours going from Kapolei to Ala Moana Center, uh, if you can be part of those type of solutions to problems, uh, that's a really good thing. But I will tell you right now, never, ever, ever engage in war on potholes. Potholes will always win. So uh, you, have to, you have to say, okay, we're doing our best, but they will come back and uh, we will do a pavement management system, which we did, which gives you some leeway, but there will always be potholes uh, as long as we've got salt water assaulting our <laughs> sure. asphalt. Putting, uh, putting myself in your, in your skin, um, leaving, you know, the practice, I mean, I, I told you prosecutorial practice, uh, like law practice in general, you know, you have certain concepts of what it's like to be a political official. And you see it from the point of practicing law, which is, it gives you a certain level of sophistication, but not experience. Okay, then one day you run for office, and my goodness, you win, and you have certain expectations going in. And one of them is, you know, like Mr. Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you are going to bring this idealistic, um, solution-oriented mentality, and you're going to fix everything. 
and you're going to you're going to bring your special talent, your special appreciation that you got as prosecutor or as or as counsel, or whatever, um, and 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 you're going to be the best mayor ever. Did um, you have that experience? What were your expectations going in? My expectations were not exactly like that. My expectations were is that if we could put together systems that would perpetuate themselves and address problems that were not going to be solved overnight, but you were looking to generations to come and give them a better quality of life and have Honolulu even more attractive than it already is, I would say that that's not overly ambitious and that can, can be accomplished. Uh, the difficulty is, is that you've got all the mayor wannabes screaming at you for not doing what they want you to do, or uh, if something goes wrong, it's clearly your fault. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's the other problem, is there's a lot of politics in this political position. Yeah. And uh, that's sometimes with the person with the right level of uh, ambition and incompetence is a nuisance. Yeah. It's sort of like um, dealing with the bureaucracy, you know, you're just passing through. We're going to be here. <laughs> we can wait you out. Or somebody who is just endlessly inept and clearly incompetent and is buying lunch for his wife, kid, you know, whoever Whatever. somebody like that <laughs> might be. Uh, and, and they're talking righteously about their desire to make sure that things were going to be delivered from the hands of that awful demon Carlisle. Uh, you know, <laughs> they're entertaining for a while and happily most of them fall on the dentrous of yesterday and don't reappear. So what part of the being a mayor did you enjoy? You know, there's a lot of things that I, I did and I was glad that I did it. And it comes back to Dingy in the long run. But I believe that going out and being an ambassador for this island and for this city and county is a big part of your job. I think it was important for us to bring the advantages that were given to us by uh, President Obama by giving us APEC. Uh, I thought that that was a huge shot in the arm. It was on your watch. It was on my watch. It was, was, a, big watch. Deal, it was for sure. a big deal. And a big challenge for the city. This, and it was done incredibly well. And one of the guys who I, I always want to give credit to this for was Louis K. Aloha, who I know has now fallen on difficult times. But he unequivocally went out and took training money and started escorting people who were going to be very, very high caliber, some of the, the greatest leaders in the world, from the airport to Waikiki. And that required necessarily complete safety and oftentimes closing down roads. And he did an absolutely great job of getting ready to do it and then executing it practically perfectly. Yeah, uh, you, get, you get three results on that. One is you give them safety. Two is you impress them with you know how efficient you are and this is a real city it's not just uh, you know in the, in the outback and i guess there's you know the other thing is you show people not only them but everyone uh that we are capable of dealing with international conferences which we is, need to show people that that's a big deal because if you can get over everybody wants to think about this as a place where you're going to get a tan on the beach <laughs> but if you can also say that is an that is basically conducive to sort of the side talkings with each other where they sit down and get the real business done uh, and they're doing it in, a, in an environment that is really friendly and not hostile and moving ahead in a positive direction for everybody who's associated with living together with each other on the, in the world. So, In terms of achievement, you look back on those years, um, what, what do you see as your biggest achievement in that period? I think always the, the real big question has been rail. I think rail has always been significant. And I think until, uh, and one of our great benefactors throughout his career was Dan Inouye, obviously. Uh, and he was 100% on board on that. And some of the people who knew and worked for him, they weren't helping the situation at all. So to get standing you know, side by side with him and seeing the first pillar go up and then seeing the rail start and to see it moving in a positive direction. Uh, and then people talking, should we call this DART dance area rapid trans, tra transport? You know, <laughs> uh, all of those things were very positive. And uh, he was a remarkable guy, and it was a pleasure to, to be able to, to get to know him well and to work with him. Yeah, that's one thing about you know, being catapulted from an, an ordinary person, the prosecuting attorney, however ordinary or extraordinary that is, 
um, to be a leader of a major jurisdiction uh, in the state and to get to know all the other players like Dan and Owe. Well, and the other one who I want to point out quickly, who's, who's fallen also on some sometimes physically difficult problems, is uh, Maisie Hirono. Maisie Hirono was critical to me when I went back to get the full funding grant agreement for the rail, and she shuttled me between different people uh, there in the in the Capitol, both Democrats and Republicans, and couldn't have been more uh, vocal about her support of the rail mm -hmm. in in a good way. So I want to. Uh, sort of shout out and say I hope you're doing well and uh, thank her for her service and uh, right. we hope there's going to be many more years of her service. I rejoin you in yeah. that. We're going to take a short break. That's Peter Carlisle, former mayor, former prosecutor, and now uh, an attorney in a downtown firm. We're going we're gonna to learn more about how rail affected the election that followed his term, what he thinks about rail now, and what he thinks about the United States Attorney's Office. We're going to cover all that in 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's plenty of time. <laughs> right after this break. <laughs> You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host on Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, we're back. We're live with Peter Carlisle. What a treat. Thank you for coming down, Peter. It's great to see you. My pleasure as always, Jay. So, rail. Okay. You set up the funding, okay, but yeah. it, it, like, that was still a big political potato. Oh, it's a hot football. potato. Yeah, it's because, a hot potato. Yeah, because, I mean, if you delay in a construction project of this size and magnitude, it immediately starts increasing the costs. So the second that you have, have this shifted from the construction to the legal system, then suddenly everything starts to fall apart because of deadlines, uh, because of union re contracts and requirements of their being able to do things at the appropriate time. All of those things create problems. And so the second that you had Ben Cayetano, Cliff Slater, and Randy Roth conspiring to make sure that we were not going to get this thing undone on time. And now, what did they do? They start saying, oh, it's so expensive, it's so expensive. Well, you're the problem, gang. Because delay it, creates it, Delay created that, cost, and, so, yeah. and they knew that, and that was their strategy. You know that that's the strategy in, uh, in trials. You, you delay, 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 and then the witnesses either fall away, or they fall asleep, or they get tired, and they, they go. So yeah. it's the same thing. Strategy. So uh, I'm thinking of TMT. There's a delay situation for you. You think? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so how did, you know, this is so, even now today, and I'll ask you in a minute what you think about the current status, but that had to have a big effect on, what do you want to call it, the mandate election uh, with Ben Caetano, and you were there, and Kirk Colwell was there. Right. Uh, how did that play? How did, how did you participate? What were your, what's your recollections, your impressions about that campaign? It depends on it's the one that I won or the, the couple that I lost. <laughs> and uh, the answer is, uh, you, you finally get to the point where you see all of this, uh, foolishness, which is what we have in election campaigns. And I don't know who it was who invented the fine art of sign waving, but one, it was brilliant in terms of it did have an impact. People see people on the side of the road. Uh, it, it, that has some effect on them. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you can buy, lie, and plagiarize your way through a campaign but you can't do that if you're running an office and running yeah, it correctly. Got to get serious. So you, you know that, that's real business, and you've got to actually do something rather than say you're doing something and have a commercial that has you know the lights going off behind you and all of the fireworks and all of the other riff riff nonsense. Yeah. Well, everybody was making some pretty high rhetoric during that campaign, and I remember the um, the, the whole uh, attempt to uh, um, defame Ben Caetano. Who was carrying it as a mandate? Remember all these oh, ads yeah. no, suggesting no, no. he was guilty of this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so much so that he actually ultimately filed a lawsuit for defamation. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't go anywhere, but <laughs> but that was it. Was a really nasty campaign. Yeah, well, it was a nasty campaign, and it, you know there there comes a point when everybody starts digging in, 
and uh, it becomes more the usual. Uh, and this is not entirely uh, devoid of behavior of the media and uh, the press. Oh, I'm sure. And uh, if they can start a fight, that sells newspaper or sells airtime. Uh, and if that's done the way it's being done absolutely ad nauseum in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, it divides people, it causes hostility, and it doesn't allow for common ground. Well, I, I mean, is it inherent in this that um, you, your ability to win that election was affected by all the, all the noise and smoke and fire and commotion about rail? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the last few elections have all had to do with uh, the rail system. And I think that has to do with, now, uh, at one point I became monstrously unpopular because I supported the rail system. Now, at the end of Caldwell's terms, we're now finding if you take a look at the civil beat polls. I saw that uh, the it, other it's, day. It's, it's gone completely down. Yeah, into they the, said into, that he was less dump. popular in Hawaii than Trump was, which is really something. Well, but he's done it in an impressive fashion. So and now it's <laughs> hanging around his neck. So, <laughs> so it's, an, it's a process <laughs> that's going to go on for every mayor while this issue is hanging there. Yeah, and the, the good news is it's going to see fruition. I mean, it's going to be finished. It's madness to start talking about tearing it down and throwing it away. Uh, that makes no sense. And so everybody has now, uh, even Deju and those guys who were adamantly opposed to it. At, at one point, everybody was accord that it had to be finished and went all the way from Kapolei, as promised, uh, to the Alamoana Center. And that's going to happen. Yeah. Can we do it? Can we get the money, especially in this administration? We can do it. And how it's going to have to be done. How long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost is a fair question. But as you said, the longer it takes, the more expensive it is. It, and there's all these lawsuits that will come out, you know, for, for breach of the contracting agreements, no? There's all sorts of, those difficulties exist. I think that they're not insurmountable. Ah. So what's your current view of it? You've written, you've taken positions on this, uh, you know, in your civilian role. <laughs> what's your, what, what, what position would you articulate today about rail? I would say that it is unconscionable to make all of those people who live on West Oahu go through a commute that usually takes up four hours of their day going and coming. Uh, that's too long and that's unfair. And we built that area west of Oahu with the promise that they would be given decent transportation. So if government fails to keep that obligation, then government suddenly becomes suspect and is no longer trustworthy. Yeah, I think government in general, nationally and locally, has lost trustworthiness. <clears throat> and I think, you know, a lot of the trustworthiness the reduction of trustworthiness in Hawaii lately, at least Oahu, has been around rail. Because uh, the, the newspaper will, you know, make raw meat out of it every time they get a chance. Yeah, and, and it does, and Oahu it is particularly about rail, and we noticed that again in the civil beat poll, because it said people were more hostile to this, what's been going on with this particular mayor than people on the neighbor islands, and that is carrying the burden of rail, which others have done before him. So if you were mayor again, mm -hmm. I mean, not to say that you're going to run, but if you no, were I'm mayor not again, going, no, no, okay, I want to be Carlisle. clear about this. This is yeah. Carlisle said, I am not going to run. So that is an edict. That is a final, uh, you know, other than that, <laughs> my life is over. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got it on the record now. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> but if you were mayor, what would you do about rail? Step by step. Step, I think the idea that they have of getting an audit makes a bunch of sense. I think then you take a look at between that and what the reality is. Uh, if I had the ability to lop some heads, I'd lop some heads, uh, and uh, hopefully so they wouldn't return, uh, the, the first being the current mayor. And uh, then after that, I would say, uh, you have got to keep up the other work, but you need to focus on finishing what you started. And that's, it's that simple. How do you, you're going to do it from here on, not with bells and whistles, not with pretty things here and there, but you're going to get the fundamentals of a rail system established, up and running, now. Okay. With all of that, uh, you know, you're a community-minded person. You've been in the mix for a long time as prosecutor because you certainly get to know the community there. And as mayor, I mean, that's enviable how much you can learn about the community as mayor. Um, and here we are, and you're, you know, practicing, but you have an eye on the U.S. Attorney's Office. I do. And, I mean, why is that? Is this, is it because you know, you you sort of your DNA has been transmogrified into prosecutorial DNA. Is that what it is? I'm going to tell you a good story about that, and that is, <laughs> I had the pleasure of being with the Dalai Lama 
for about three days, and we were talking to each other and giving, doing press conferences, and we were together. And he said, choose to be optimistic, you'll feel better. And then he said, you know, what I've learned in life is I'm the Dalai Lama and will always be the Dalai Lama, and that has this certain prestige. But what I think of myself as is a Tibetan monk. That is what my DNA is. My DNA is prosecutorial. You know, I would agree with that. I mean, that's pretty much why I asked the question, because yeah, I think it's true. You, you still, you know, present as a prosecutor. You, I think your, your whole way of looking at things is still as a prosecutor. And prosecutors are special people, as we talked because about. Because they it. want to see the justice system. Yes, okay, they do. Jay, that's the reason why. I mean, I was, when I was in the military, I'll tell you the truth. When I was in the military, I was most of the time a prosecutor. And I stood up in front of the military judge in those cases, and I would say, and I quote, <clears throat> may it please the court. My name is Jay Fidel, and I represent the United States of America. It puts a chill in my back even now. Uh, you said that, and a chill went up my back because you <laughs> said it so accomplished and well and, and experienced. I haven't experienced that yet, and I would love to be able to say yeah. I represent the United States yeah, of America. Yeah. So, well, let's take a look at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office here. What's it like? How big is it? What does it do? Why was it different than the prosecutor's office? Well, the prosecutor's office is handled by the city and county employees and prosecutors, and it's under the umbrella of the authority of the attorney general. But there's case law that says really the person who's going to be doing the prosecuting is the city and county person. So there you're representing the people of the state of Hawaii under the umbrella of the attorney general. When you get to that next level, when you start saying that you're a federal prosecutor, now you represent the interests of the United States all the way up to the commander in chief, which of course is President Trump, uh, and you go and you represent them in federal court for the District of Hawaii. This is something. It is something, and it's uh, you know it's very and they are elite and they are accomplished. So your job is to go into an organization that is already running well and has very sophisticated and capable people and either put it, give them a little more limelight that they deserve or figure out what they think that they knew, the resources that they need and how that you could sit there and voice their concerns and their needs uh, from the perspective of being in charge of that entire operation, which is about 65 people. 65 people, yeah. wow, that's a pretty big office. And they do the, very big cases. Okay. The, the city and county is 220 people. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and the city and county of Honolulu is 10,000. So yeah. this is a gem of prosecutorial ability. Efficiency. And, and they need to be able to be supported in whatever fashion that they can be, including with, you know, sort of a wise guy type of uh, prosecutorial yeah. thug. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've always been impressed with federal prosecutors, and I was thinking of this fellow that we had here in this chair a few months ago, Kenji Price. Okay. In Carl Smith. Uh, he was uh, in the Army. Uh, he was in, Viet uh, not Vietnam, <laughs> I live in another time, uh, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan as, a, as an officer there. Um, he uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania, got to be editor-in-chief of the Law Review, and then he joined the Eastern District of New York, which is a very classy district in Brooklyn, uh, I mean, as far as law enforcement is concerned, uh, when he was an assistant U.S. attorney there. Now he's here. And he's a very, he's, he's also got it in his DNA, if you will. Um, and he's a special guy. And I think they all are. I think those prosecutors in the U.S., it's the way the country has developed. It's a very class operation. It's a very high-level club, don't you think? Kenji is, I mean, he is a phenomenal guy. I mean, he's got two bronze stars. His military credentials are absolutely impeccable. Uh, he did phenomenal prosecutor at the line level. Uh, what I don't see from him is the experience of actually running either a, a section or the entire office. Uh, but he has admirable qualities from one end to the other. And I think that he's uh, a tremendous candidate. And uh, uh, I would have crossed paths with him if I was one younger and two, I had decided to go to the University of Pennsylvania, which <laughs> I did not go to because a friend took me down to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I love the Tar Heels. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think you're the perfect guy for this job. That's just my opinion. Um, and I think this is the perfect job for you, too. And so it's a really good match, and it's at a time when we need it. But I mean, we have a strange circumstance here. Just as in many other appointments around the country, this administration is, for some reason, dragging its heels on appointing uh, U.S. attorneys in various districts and other officials in other, in other uh, federal agencies. 
So what's the process like and how long is it going to take before this settles down? I don't think anybody has an answer to that. I know that, uh, that we were given, some people were called, and I don't know how many people were called to give an interview. And we spent about an hour uh, talking face-to-face -face over electronics uh, about the questions that they wanted to have answered and things that you that they thought what your view was and what you would do if some young AUSA came up to you and said, hey, listen, old man, uh, you've done about four or five murder trials. And I said, no, I've done about 50 or 60 of them. <laughs> I said, well, I got a murder trial coming down the pike. Uh, what can you tell me? And then I could impart what little wisdom I have in their direction and let them move forward. Yeah. And they're, all of them are competent enough to be able to do that. I mean, it's been under, Flo Nakakuni was a phenom, phenomenon in and of herself. Elliot Anoki is the dean of the history of uh, that entire organization. So he's the institutional knowledge. So it's already got strong pillars. And uh, hopefully with the right person, the pillars can made be made even a little better. People, people don't know how important the United States attorney is, especially here even. You know, I remember the stealth bomber espionage case where this fellow stole the plans for the stealth bomber and he gave them to the Chinese, who now have them, and who in fact have built, shortly after the trial of this, of this spy, um, they built the stealth bomber according to the plans they got from him. <laughs> it's a pretty serious business. Ouch. Ouch, and it happened right here on Bishop Street, within blocks of where we're, we're sitting, amazingly enough, and the prosecution was within blocks of where we're sitting. And we had actually a show about it. Uh, the, the prosecutor who handled that case got permission to talk to us, and he told us how it was on the prosecutor's side. I tell you, I was so impressed about you know the, the, the relentless prosecutorial effort that was necessary to do that case, um, and all of the issues. At, you know, it's but it's defending the country, and that's. I think I see that in you. You know, the thing that I'd like to see is that there be a little more light shed on that. If you go, if you have something like the Xerox massacre, it's visceral because so many people were impacted by loss of loved ones and other people. With Langford, everybody found him so despicable that they wanted to make sure that he was never going to come out again. But I think that if you had enough sunshine on that office and the capabilities and the accomplishments that they've had, I think that that would be better for everybody. I think that that would be a huge step, not only for that office, but for the community to also know, hey, look, uh, it's not just Pearl Harbor that's America, it's this whole island is America and the USA, and uh, that's a golden thing for us to, yeah. to, to comprehend. I think that's true, and I think the U.S. attorney uh, needs to communicate with the public about this, uh, such as the way you did when you were prosecutor and mayor. Um, and, I, and I also think um, that uh, the administration ought to make these appointments really soon because it's an important appointment. All appointments in, at federal, you know, executive levels are important, but this is especially important. I agree with you because I'm a law enforcement guy, so I believe in that to my, uh, to my very bones. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for coming Jay, You down. know, it's always fun to talk Great with to you. Talk it's to a you. pleasure and a half, my friend. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>